Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2024. Welcome to the reading of lesson number 12 of the Sabbath School lessons on the book of Mark. This lesson is titled Tried and Crucified and is ready for teaching on Sabbath, September 21. The author is Dr. Thomas R. Shepherd of Andrews University and your reader today is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, September 14. Before we start, let's pray. O oh, Heavenly Father, we are dealing with some very interesting and emotional and very important studies this week as we look at the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus. Lord, we just thank you that you came, that each of us could have the opportunity of salvation, but that we also could share that salvation with those that we love, those we care for, and those around us. And as we do so, we pray that others may come to know and love you and want to walk with you as we do. And if some of us are struggling, Lord, as we read this lesson, we just pray that we will understand that it was your gift to us that Jesus went through this passion narrative, that he went through the cross and that he did that just for each of us. And today I'd like to pray for those who are gathering at the South Queensland Camp Meeting at Dacobin in Queensland. Uh, they'll be there for two whole weekends and the week in between. And Lord, I pray that you'll be with each of the speakers, all those who are attending, and those who are stepping onto the ground for the first time to learn about Jesus. I'd also like to pray for Sunshine Is and her family and Jacqueline Masuka Mepedza from Zimbabwe in Africa, for Gina Mendoza, who's asked for prayer, and for Christopher and a friend of Andronica Wells. And Hazel Jeffrey and Doreen Hines and her mother. Lord, they need your help at this time. We pray that you'll be with them and bless them. And now, as we open your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide our thoughts as I read these words from the lesson and the texts that come with them. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Mark chapter 15, verse 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Gabriel, why don't you read our memory text for us again? I'm Gabriel from Harvey Bay, and our memory verse is from Mark chapter 15, verse 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mark chapter 15, verse 34. Mark 15 is the heart of the Passion narrative. It presents the trial of Jesus, his condemnation, the mockery by the soldiers, his crucifixion, and then his death and burial. The events in this chapter are presented in stark, crisp detail, likely because the author lets the facts speak for themselves. Throughout this chapter, irony plays an important role. Because of this, it is helpful to have a clear definition of what irony is. Irony often contains three components. One, two levels of meaning. Two, the two levels are in conflict or contrast to each other. And three, someone does not see the irony and does not recognise what is happening and does not know that he or she is the one who will suffer the consequences. This week, from the question of Pilate, Are you the king of the Jews? To the mocking soldiers, the sign above the cross, and the mocking of the religious leaders, he saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. To the unexpected appearance of Joseph of Arimathea, the chapter is filled with painful ironies that nevertheless reveal powerful truths about the death of Jesus and what it means.
Sunday, September 15. Are you the King of the Jews? Read Mark chapter 15, verses 1 to 15. What kind of ironic situations occur here? Mark 15, beginning at verse 1. Immediately, in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes of the whole council, and they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered and said to him, It is as you say. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. Then Pilate asked him again, saying, Do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you. But Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate marvelled. Now, at the feast, he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. And there was one named Barabbas, who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. Then the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? for he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. Pilate answered and said to them again, What then do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus, after he had scourged him, to be crucified. Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea from AD 26 to AD 36. He was not a kind leader, and a number of his actions caused consternation among the inhabitants of the land as we compare here with Luke 13, verse 1. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. The Jewish trial of Jesus resulted in a death sentence for blasphemy, but under Roman rule, the Jews could not execute people in most cases, and so they brought Jesus to Pilate for condemnation. The charge against Jesus before Pilate is not mentioned, but it is possible to ascertain the charge based on the brief question that Pilate asks Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? In verse 2. In Old Testament times, Israel anointed its kings, so it's not hard to see how the term Messiah, really meaning anointed one, could be twisted into claiming homage as a king in competition with the emperor. Thus, the charge brought before the Sanhedrin was blasphemy, while the charge brought before the governor was sedition, which would lead to death. The irony is that Jesus is both the Messiah and the King of the Jews. His convictions for blasphemy and sedition were mistaken. He should have received homage and worship instead. Yet, Jesus still acts in a kingly manner. His response to Pilate, you have said so, in Mark 15 verse 2, is non-committal. He does not deny the title or affirm it. This response may suggest that he is a king, but of a different sort. And we're comparing here with John chapter 18 verses 33 to 38. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, 
You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. Mark 15.6 introduced into the narrative a custom of releasing a prisoner at the time of the Passover. In verse 9, Pilate asks if they want him to release the king of the Jews. And though he might have meant it ironically, the irony is really playing out against him. Mark 15 verses 9 and 10 is a study in perception and imperception. Let's begin at verse 9. But Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. Pilate perceives that the religious leaders turned over Jesus because of envy. But he does not perceive that. By asking the crowd, he is playing into the hands of the religious leaders. They stir up the crowd and call for Jesus' crucifixion. Pilate recoils. Crucifixion was such a terrible way to die, particularly for one he considered innocent. How painfully ironic that the pagan governor wanted to release the Messiah, while the religious leaders wanted him crucified. And so to finish today, what can keep you from following the crowd when the pressure is great to do so? Monday, September 16, Hail King of the Jews. Read Mark chapter 15, verses 15 to 20. What did the soldiers do to Jesus, and what is its significance? Let's begin with verse 15 of Mark 15. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him, and when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. The Romans utilised a severe form of beating to prepare prisoners for execution. The victim was stripped of his clothes, tied to a pole, and then lashed with leather whips to which pieces of bone glass, stones and nails were tied. After Jesus was whipped, the soldiers tasked with his execution continued his humiliation by clothing him in a purple robe, placing a crown of thorns on his head and mocking him as king of the Jews. The group of soldiers is called a battalion, in this case anywhere from 200 to 600 men. The irony in the scene is evident to the reader because Jesus really is the king, and the mocking words of the soldiers proclaim this truth. The action of the soldiers was a parody of how soldiers hailed the Roman emperor with the words, Hail, Caesar, Emperor. Thus, there is an implicit comparison to the emperor. The actions of the soldiers in mocking Jesus are striking his head with a reed, spitting on him and kneeling down in mock homage. All three of these actions are expressed in Greek with the imperfect tense. In this setting, this tense has the idea of repetitive action. Thus, they kept striking him, kept spitting on him, and kept kneeling down in mock homage before him. Jesus takes all of this in silence, not responding at all. The typical pattern of Roman execution by crucifixion involved having the convicted person carry the cross naked to the place of execution. 
This pattern again was to humiliate and shame the person completely before the community. But the Jews abhorred public nakedness. Mark 15.20 notes that they removed the purple cloak and put his own clothes back on him. Thus, this appears to be a concession that the Romans made to the Jews at that time and place. Think about all the irony here. Their bowing and paying homage to Jesus as king was all in mockery, even though Jesus really was the king, not just of the Jews, but of the Romans as well. And so to finish the day, these men had no idea what they were doing. Why, though, will their ignorance not excuse them on the judgment day? Tuesday, Tuesday, September 17, The Crucifixion. Read Mark chapter 15, verses 21 to 38. What terrible and painful irony appears in these passages. Mark 15, beginning at verse 21. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah this King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land, until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. At this point in the Passion narrative, Jesus is a silent victim, controlled by people who are bent on his death. Throughout the Gospel, up to his arrest, he was the master of activities. Now he is acted upon. Though he was a robust itinerant preacher, the beating he had received and the lack of food and sleep wore him down to where a stranger had to bear his cross. At the cross, his garments were removed and became the property of the soldiers, who cast lots to see whose they would be. These words come from Psalm 22, verse 18. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Crucifixion was a fairly bloodless method of execution. The nails used to fasten a person to the cross were likely driven through the wrist below the palm where no major blood vessels run. We read about these nails in John chapter 20 verses 24 to 29. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, 
unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side, stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. In both Hebrew and Greek, the word for hand can refer to both the hand and the forearm. The palm of the hand itself does not have the structures necessary to carry the weight of the body in crucifixion. The median nerve runs through the centre of the forearm and would be crushed by the nails, causing excruciating pain up the arm. Breathing was difficult. To get a good breath, victims of crucifixion had to push against their nailed feet and flex their arms, again causing agonising pain. Exhaustion asphyxia was one of the possible causes of death. Jesus received tremendous mockery and humiliation during his crucifixion. The Gospel of Mark has a revelation secrecy motif in which Jesus typically calls for silence about who he is. Consequently, such Christological titles as Lord, Son of God or Christ do not appear often in the narrative. This element changes at the cross. He cannot be hidden. It is ironic that it is the religious leaders who use these titles in mocking Jesus. How these men are condemning themselves. One of their mocking statements stands out. In Mark 15, verse 31, they say, He saved others, he cannot save himself. To make their point about his helplessness on the cross, they indicate that he did help others. The Greek verb can mean save, heal or rescue. Thus, ironically, they admit he is the saviour. The irony goes further. The reason he could not or would not save himself was because at the cross he was saving others. And so to finish today... Read John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, and then think about what this passage tells us about Jesus, the same Jesus who is being crucified here in Mark. How do we wrap our minds around what Christ's death means for us? John 1, beginning at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Wednesday, September 18. Forsaken by God. Read Mark chapter 15, verses 33 to 41. What are Jesus' only words on the cross in Mark? And what does Christ's death ultimately mean for us all? Mark 15, beginning at verse 33. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eli, lama sevaktani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, 
Surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. The Gospel of Mark presents the cross as a very dark place, both physically and spiritually. A supernatural darkness descended on Calvary from about noon of that Friday until about 3 p.m. Verse 33 read, And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. The words of Jesus on the cross are called the cry of dereliction, as he prays, crying out to God, asking why he has been forsaken. He is quoting from Psalm 22, verse 1. Other references to the same psalm occur in Mark 15, verses 24 and 29, indicating that the scriptures are being fulfilled in the death of Christ. Verse 24 reads, And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes, they cast lots, to see what each would get. And verse 29, Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days? Even in the evil plotting of men, the will of God is being fulfilled. Jesus' words from the cross are reported in Aramaic along with translation. The words, My God, My God, are Eloi, Eloi, in the verse a transliteration of the Aramaic Elehi, E-L-A-H-I. It would be easy to hear Jesus as calling for Elijah, Aramaic E-L-I-Y-Y-A-H, Eliah, which means, my God is Yahweh. This is the mistake that some bystanders make. What becomes striking about this passage is the parallel it has to the baptism of Jesus in Mark 1, verses 9 to 11. Now let's read. baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And so we have a table here in the pamphlet today, and uh, the two titles of the uh, two parts of the table are the baptism and it's mark 1 verses 9 to 11 that we just read and the cross mark 15 verses 34 to 39 so under the baptism we have john baptizes jesus under the cross we have jesus baptism and we compare here with mark 10 verse 38 you don't know what you are asking jesus said can you drink the cup i drink to be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. And then under baptism, there's John, the Elijah figure, as we see in Mark 9, verses 11 to 13. And they asked him, Why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. And under the cross we have just these two words, calling Elijah. And then under the baptism, the heavens were split. Under the cross, the veil is split. Under baptism, we have spirit, and the word there is pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A. And at the cross, Jesus expires, ex-pneo, E-X-P-N-E-O. And under baptism, we have God's voice, the beloved Son. And under the cross, we have the centurion, says the Son of God. 
What these parallels suggest is that at the baptism of Jesus in Mark 1 is the beginning of his ministry as prophesied in Daniel 9, 24-27. What occurs in Mark 15 at the cross is the culmination or goal of his ministry as he dies as a ransom for many, as we read in Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The death of Jesus on the cross also fulfills part of the prophecy of Daniel 9, 24-27, which reads, Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Know and understand this, from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble, after the sixty-two sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple he will set up an abomination that causes desolation, until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. The tearing of the temple veil recorded in Mark 15, verse 38, points to the fulfilment of the sacrificial system as type meets antitype, and a new phase of salvation history begins. And so to finish today, even despite the evil plotting of humanity, God's purposes were fulfilled. Why should this help us learn that, regardless of what happens around us, we can still trust God and know that His goodness will ultimately prevail? Thursday, September 19, Laid to Rest Read Mark chapter 15, verses 42 to 47. What is the significance of Joseph of Arimathea's intervention, especially since all of Jesus' disciples were nowhere to be seen? Mark 15, beginning at verse 42. It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So, as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some fine linen, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. After all that drama, the most mundane thing happens next. For starters, dead people always have to be buried. But several factors in what follows are quite touching spiritually, and others are extremely important historically. In this passage, Joseph of Arimathea appears for the first and last time in the Gospel of Mark. He was a respected member of the Sanhedrin and one of the urban elites. As a wealthy and respected man, he had standing with the governor, which explains how he could dare approach Pilate and ask for the body of Jesus. It is a touching detail that a member of the council took such interest in Jesus' burial. Meanwhile, where were Jesus' trusted disciples in all this? One historical detail of extreme importance here is the verification of the death of Jesus. 
Mark 15 verse 43 tells of Joseph's request for the body of Jesus. But Pilate was surprised to hear that Jesus was already dead in verse 44. He therefore summoned the centurion in charge of the crucifixion and asked if Jesus was dead already. The centurion confirmed that it was so. This is important because of the later claim by some that Jesus did not die on the cross, but only fainted. The testimony of the centurion to the Roman governor directly counters that assertion. The Romans did, after all, know how to execute criminals. Joseph brought a linen shroud to wrap Jesus, and he laid his body in a tomb hewn from rock. This tomb was large enough to walk into, as we read in the next chapter, Mark 16 and verse 5. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting at the right side, and they were alarmed. Along with Joseph, the Gospel writer notes two women who saw the location, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph. These two, along with Salome, watched the crucifixion from a distance. All three will go to the tomb on Sunday morning with the intention to complete their work of embalming Jesus, as you read in Mark 16 verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Why the reference to these three women? They will be the witnesses to the empty tomb in Mark 16 and thus are important witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus. And so to finish the day, how ironic that Jesus' followers are missing in action, while a member of the Sanhedrin, the very body that condemned Jesus, becomes the hero here. How can we be sure that, in crucial times, we are not missing in action either? Friday, September 20. Further Thought Pilate longed to deliver Jesus, we read in The Desire of Ages, page 738, but he saw that he could not do this and yet retain his own position and honour. Rather than lose his worldly power, he chose to sacrifice an innocent life. How many, to escape loss or suffering in like manner, sacrifice principle? Conscience and duty point one way, and self-interest points another. The current sets strongly in the wrong direction, and he who compromises with evil is swept away into the thick darkness of guilt. End of quote. And then from the same book, page 753, Upon Christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted a transgressor, that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity, filled the soul of his Son with consternation. All his life, Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now, with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Saviour in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. Look at how central the theology of substitution was to Ellen G. White and also to the Bible. See, for instance, Isaiah chapter 53. And I'll read that now. This is one of my favourite chapters in the Bible. I hope it's yours too. Isaiah chapter 53, beginning at verse 1. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? 
He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Why is any theology that downplays the central role of substitution and Christ dying in our stead, paying in himself the penalty for our sins, a false theology. 2. Who or what is the Barabbas in today's world that gets asked for instead of Jesus? 3. What should the story of Joseph of Arimathea tell us about not judging outward appearances? And question 4. Review Daniel 9 verses 24 to 27. Why should you be able to give a Bible study on this section to anyone who asks, Can you? Well, let's read those texts. That's Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Seventy-sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the sixty-two sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Why should you be able to give a Bible study on this section to anyone who asks? And can you? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Bringing Armenia to Christ by Andrew McChesney While Anush was praying for her father, she also was praying for the other 4,000 residents of her town in Armenia. 
Then God began to touch hearts. After her baptism, Anush met regularly with two other young women to pray for the town. Then they organised seminars that attracted several dozen young people. After that, with assistance from the Euro-Asian Division, they chartered buses and took groups of 50 young people on sightseeing tours around Armenia. Church members greeted and befriended the young people at every stop. Anush saw that the young people became more sincere and open in their questions about God when visiting places far from home. As interest in the Adventist message grew, a pastor started to visit the town every other Sunday to hold talks about relationships, finances and other practical issues. Many people attended the meetings over two years. Father was influential and respected, so when he became a Seventh-day Adventist, the whole town took notice. People began to talk about faith and his decision to go to a church that was not the national church. His baptism broke the ice. The town's Adventist church, which once consisted of seven faithful women meeting in a private home, has now moved into a rented hall where dozens of people gather every Sabbath. Church members and others also meet online to pray daily. Plans are underway to buy a church building. Today, Father, whose name is Amen Safarian, works together with his wife, Gayen Badalian, and daughter, Anush Safarian, to make three kinds of tofu at their company. As the only tofu company in Armenia, it has been featured on national television and Father had an opportunity to share his faith when asked why he makes tofu. Father is a church elder and leader of the Family Ministries Department. He and Mother, who run the Church Health Ministries Department, are in high demand at other churches. Father is seen as a role model in a country where many mothers and children still go to church without their husbands and fathers. Father, Mother and Anush want to change that. See, this normal Armenian man is an Adventist. Church leaders say in introducing Father at speaking engagements, Men, you are not alone. This man goes to church on Sabbath. Anush shares her story at churches and youth camps, saying, Do not be satisfied with your husbands and fathers just allowing you to go to church. Plead with God for them to go with you. Part of last quarter's 13th Sabbath offering went to open a centre of influence for families in Yerevan, Armenia. Thank you for helping spread the gospel with your offerings. <laughs> 